those 18 months of being at home, seeing my daughter every single day, that was the thing that transformed me, I think, more than anything. It was almost like the final straw that, that broke the camel's back. That's Steve Schlafman, professional transition coach and creator of Where the Road Bends. And this is Make Yourself at Home. The podcast that takes you into the homes of people you admire to show you a side you don't usually get to see. I'm Kristen Twyford, and every week we'll talk to someone at the top of their career to explore holistic success and how work and home are inextricably intertwined. Along the way, we hope to inspire you to live well, whatever that means to you. Make Yourself at Home is presented by Nines, the household management app designed to help you manage your home and everything that comes with it so you can live with ease. Today, we're in Steve Schlafman's home in upstate New York, where Steve and his family are moving full-time after 15 years in New York City. The move is part of an ongoing transition. After making partner at a multi-billion dollar VC firm, Steve felt something was missing. And at the prime of his investing career, he decided to walk away. Today, he's a professional transition coach, helping high performers find their next calling, and the creator of Where the Road Bends, a podcast and newsletter exploring life transitions. In this conversation, Steve shares how he found his own calling, why he now sees himself as a husband, a father, a cook, and a lifelong learner rather than just a worker, and how home has played a central role in reshaping his life. Make Yourself at Home with Steve Schlafman. Steve, thank you so much for having us into your home. We're so excited to talk with you. I'm, I'm thrilled you're here with me. <laughs> Tell me about where you're sitting. So I am sitting, I guess if we were to zoom out, uh, right. I am in Ulster County, New York. So we are, or I am about two hours north of New York City. Um, Ulster County is uh, home to some amazing places, including Woodstock, New York. And my mm -hmm. wife and I bought a small little place, like a, a, a city escape eight years ago, and we're actually making it our full-time home in three weeks. So big move on the horizon, which I'm thrilled about. And where I'm sitting right now is we have a barn structure on our property, and uh, this is where I work when I'm up here. It's, it's, a, it's a special place. I love it. And tell me a little bit about what home means to you. Well, that, that, has, that has changed a lot, especially in the last five years as, as I became a parent. But mm -hmm. for me, home is a place where I can get away, unwind, um, you know, be my full self, uh, and, and really embrace all the different roles that I have in life. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that of a husband, a father a coach, a cook, uh, a, a lifelong learner, um, a meditator, a, an athlete home, home allows me to express myself in all those different dimensions. And so it's, it's a place that, uh, obviously I love spending a lot of time at, uh, and I would also say it's it's a special place because it has a bed and I love to sleep when my kids are actually sleeping through the night. And so it's the place that I get to sleep. So I, I do love home in that regard. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And I love <laughs> the way that you just described that too, because I think it's so easy to really fall into this trap of describing ourselves by our jobs. And I think you really touched on all these different pieces of who you are. And I want to talk a little bit about how you got to this place of how you think about yourself and your identity and how you sort of separated it from your job. Because I think, you know, you have been, you've told your story in a lot of different ways of how you've transitioned to this sort of version of yourself. So take me back sort of to the beginning and what you were creating. What did you, when you were building your VC career, what did you see your life looking at like you know what what were you working towards and what did you hope all of those different buckets would be were you thinking about all those different buckets that you just described or were you really just kind of thinking about one thing as i as i sit with that question 
it, it's really remarkable to to think back. So I I got into the investing world. I mean, I guess technically around 2007, um, mm. when I worked for the Craft Group, they're the owners and operators of the New England Patriots. So I had exposure to the investing world when I worked for that organization. I became a full time investor as like my main thing in 2010. And for almost, I mean, really like 17 years, it's all I knew. Um, and my existence was really being an investor. And like, sure, I had some dimensionality to my life, but not much. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking about work pretty much every minute of the day. Uh, and then, interestingly enough, in 2015, I got sober. I'm very public about it. And for me... Um, my, my substances were Adderall, which I was prescribed, uh, for a long time and also, uh, marijuana cannabis. And mm -hmm. I, I definitely drank more than the average person. Why do I bring this up in the context of your question? Because once I stopped kind of numbing myself and being obsessed with, with only work, I started to notice all these thoughts and feelings and, um, patterns and habits that I just didn't even know I had. And by 2017, I decided to uh, resign from my role at a partner as a partner at a multi-billion dollar firm in New York, RRE Ventures. They were great to me. And um, I ended up entering a coaching school um, to, to become trained and certified as a coach. And mm -hmm. in that training, they asked us to do a life visualization. And my visualization was literally me being an investor, being in New York. It was like, think about your life 10 years from now. And it was like, had a sweet apartment in the West village. I was investing and somehow integrating coaching, but it was like, it wasn't, dad. It wasn't like all the, mm -hmm. the words that I used to describe myself. And that process, it's been a windy road to add this multidimensionality. Um, but it required me to, to shed a lot before I could add a lot, if that right. makes sense. So not even shed, but more like accept and integrate is a better way to say it. Yeah. And when you were, you know, doing that grind, were you doing it because you loved it or because you were working towards something? Did you have a goal? You, did Was there a certain lifestyle that you wanted? I mean, so I would say that for me, I've never been motivated by things mm -hmm. um, for, for a whole bunch of reasons that I now understand um, and by things like material possessions. Um, mm -hmm. For me, money was always about security and safety. Um, I was raised by a single mother, didn't grow. I mean, basically, our family lived paycheck to paycheck for a long time, interestingly enough, in an upper middle class suburb uh, north of Boston. Um, so we were surrounded by people that were very well off. And so for me, money was always about security. Um, so I investing was a really nice way to get secure, um, mm -hmm. not secure as in like needing fuck you money, but like having a good quality life. And then what I ultimately realized as I had more and more success and I would get, you know, bonuses and, and checks, uh, from, from when investments did well, carry checks. Um, what I realized was that I, I felt no different. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not like the money, the money hit my bank account and I was like celebrating. It was almost like this, this sense of emptiness. And it was at that point when I was like, okay, well, if I, it, it, once I got conscious and sober, I was like, okay, well, if I'm investing, like, why am I doing this? Is it because it's going to make me feel safe and secure or is it because I really enjoy doing this? And the more I got conscious, the more I was like, yeah, like this is fun. And like, it's an interesting job that like is great fodder for like cocktail parties, but it doesn't, 
it doesn't feel aligned with the person I'm becoming. And so Mm -hmm. ultimately, you know, over, over a, a, a several year period, I just ultimately, um, after a lot of oscillation between like, am I a coach or am I an investor? Oh, I'm a coach, but I'm still investing to finally just saying like, yeah, I'm a coach and I own it and I love it. And it's how I'm fully expressing myself. Mm-hmm. And in that journey, that seven year time period where you decided, okay, I'm going to go all in on coaching. How did that start to affect every other bucket in your life? All of those other things that you described, how did it start to have an impact at home and in other parts of your life? Well, I would say it, it, it transformed every aspect of my life because Mm -hmm. And in some ways it was like, I I sort of view life as this unfolding. So it's not like I consciously planned to to do it this way, Mm -hmm. but what, what ultimately happened was the more that I just moved into alignment of the things that matter most, like the first, what I would say is even backing up, like I I find that when, and and I'm not the first person to say it, but I've seen it in my own experience is when you hit midlife, you start to hear, like if you have a strong internal voice, like the theme that comes up over and over, like, Hey, you need to look at this. It sort of is like that, that, that which you're called to, to look at or choose not to. And for me at first, you know, I turned 33, 34 and it was like sobriety, like Steve, what are you doing? You're going to kill yourself. You're not taking good care of your body. You feel like shit. You're numbing yourself. And that was the call to action or, you know, the call to mm-hmm. adventure, as they would say in the hero's journey. <laughs> um, the net for me, the next thing was, um, was, hey, you're unhappy at work. Like you're sitting in these partner meetings and you're hearing these pitches and like you're performing, I'm putting that in quotes, but like Mm -hmm. you don't feel like this is for you. Like you feel out of alignment. And so inevitably I went, and so what what happened was is the more that I listened to that inner voice and there was like that big like first sobriety and health, then... um, career and like calling and vocation once I squared that with who I wanted to be it's like it just the floodgates opened and then I'm like oh well I've always wanted to even though I was never like a a good student in like middle school and high school I want to write and I just had this desire to write and so I'm gonna write and become a cyclist and you know with COVID I began cooking every night and um obviously I have a strong meditation practice. Um, so in journaling and, and so, and then became a dad. And, and so then what ultimately happened is, is like all these dimensions of my life just kind of have came online in a very organic and beautiful way. And that's not to say that I have dismissed my career and and put it on the back burner like do i work 60 to 70 hours a week like i used to absolutely not because i want to be present for my girls and be the dad that i never had as a kid um and i'm still working hard you know 40 50 plus hours a week and like when i'm working i'm all in and that's a, giving me the the ability to build a really what I think is a special practice, uh, coaching practice um, that is going to evolve and be successful over a long period of time because I'm not striving, I'm not pushing too hard, I'm sort of letting things unfold organically and naturally. Mm-hmm. And you've written a lot about holistic ambition, and I want to talk about that a little bit and what that means to you. What what is holistic ambition to you? Yeah, well, I forget exactly the the definition that I used when I when I wrote that piece, uh, but the way to think about it is if we step back and we look at the word ambition, uh, historically it's it's been meant to um, to talk about achievement and specific achievement in uh, what I would claim is like capitalistic endeavors right? Go big, go home, you know, being the best in the world at something. And it's sort of like, 
it, it, what I all, and, and a lot of it was around career success and self-worth and, and striving, achri- achieving and all these things. And what I ultimately began to tune into is that there's what's known as like, um, this blind ambition, which is just like, I'm going to be successful because I can be successful and I don't care what the costs of that ambition is. And we we see a lot of examples of that can turn out ver- very badly. On the other side is like, what if there's a new kind of ambition that's more balanced? And so that's the kind of ambition where it's like, you know, I don't work 80 hours a week. I'm not trying to build a, a unicorn, but I'm also the most ambitious I've ever been because I'm ambitious in all these other areas of my life. You know, I'm, I want to be an amazing dad. I want to be an amazing coach. I want to take care of my body. I want to become a great writer and express myself in, in new ways and in new mediums. And so for me, that's what this new form of ambition is. Uh, I also want to be a great husband. I should, I have an amazing wife, um, who is also an entrepreneur. Uh, and so the only way to do that is by like, you know, I want, uh, is by prioritizing, knowing exactly what's important to me. And like, this is a point in my life where, you know what, like, I don't have a huge social life. It's like, yes, we have friends, but I'm not going out every night. I'm not like I'm home every night at six o'clock, six thirty, and I put my girls down to bed, I cook dinner, I hang out with my wife, I might work for an hour, read, and that and and you know what? That's enough for me. Um mm-hmm. and it's it and and I think like you know, this this all comes back to a conversation I had with a good friend of mine. Uh he's a he's a coach based in New York City, Jonathan Basker. And when I was deciding, oscillating between like, do I become an investor or do I, uh, or do I, or sorry, do I stay an investor? Do I go into coaching full time? And he said, you know, he said, you know, I thought I wasn't ambitious until I realized my ambition is just to have a good life. And as soon as I said that, I was like, yeah, like I don't, I don't need to like set the world on fire and leave the biggest legacy. Like I just want to live a good life and that's, that's my ambition. And so just to, just to sort of tie a bow around this, like holistic ambition is how do you, you can be ambitious about anything. Like you can be ambitious about volunteering. You can be ambitious about taking care of your aging parents. You can be about ambitious about just being cure, a curious human being and moving through the world with more wonder and curiosity. And you can be ambitious about building a, an incredible coaching practice or a company or making your home look so beautiful and comfortable that when you have friends over or family, it just becomes like an amazing place to gather. And so, mm-hmm. um, yeah, ambition shouldn't just be uh, attributed to work because I, I actually believe that ambition can be a good thing if directed in the right way, it, you know, if it's coming from the right place. Absolutely. And a lot of this sounds like it's really about alignment because really it's not like you're working so hard to get a certain lifestyle or you are shifting the way that you're working so that you can spend more time at home. It's really kind of both things coming together in a way that allows you to thrive in both places and in all of your different arenas. Yeah, exactly. And I think the word alignment is, is really important. Uh, you know, I think, I think to, I think back to my life a decade ago and you know what? It's not like I was miserable and out of alignment. Well, I was probably Mm -hmm. too numb to realize if I'm being honest, but, um, my life was good, but what I realized is the more aware I became of myself and the more that I listened to my inner voice and the more that I felt my body when I was in certain situations, I can begin to feel like when I'm constricting, when I'm not saying what I want to say, when I'm like holding back mm-hmm. and I could feel that in a, in a lot of ways I was out of integrity and what I, what I've come to appreciate through lots of training, lots of therapy, lots of coaching 
is that when we're able to really listen to ourselves and express that to the world in whatever shape or form, it like life gets gets so much easier. It gets mm-hmm. it, and and it, what ends up happening is this feeling of like you know life isn't happening to me. You know this is something my my teachers Jim Detmer and Diana Chapman of the country like what they say is like you know and this doesn't come from them but it's like life doesn't have it starts to happen through you where. An example of that is I'm, I'm kicking off a book project. Uh, well, I should say I'm exploring a book project and I've been jamming on that for two weeks. And uh, out of the blue, I had an idea related to the book um, for a course, like a, like a cohort based course. Mm-hmm. And I've always wanted to teach a course, but I'm also, I was also like, yeah, I'm not going to force it. And then all of a sudden this shit, they, it just flew out of me. And that's what happens when you're in alignment is, and you're sit like life is a creative process. And so when we're open to, um, when we're open to just being with our experience, what we find is there are times where something comes really easy and there are times where it, it's really hard. And I think you know, for me, what alignment means is that it, we, we follow the flow. We follow where, where things, where, where our energy and curiosity goes as opposed to trying to fight it. Yeah. And I'm sure on this path to alignment, there were a lot of hurdles or challenges or things that you had to undo in your mind, you know, especially after you've been on a very successful VC path it's hard to walk away from that and it's hard to change your mindset. I think that's something that everybody struggles with where it's you have something that you might want to do and you can say it, but it's so hard to actually make that happen. What were some, you know, challenges that you had to work through or things you had to do undo in your mind or, you know, key hurdles that you really had to overcome in this process? Yeah. Um, well, I would say anytime you go through a, like an identity shift, and I, I don't like the word crisis because mm-hmm. um, I just I, I I don't I don't think it's a, I think it's it's just a shift, and in a shift it, there comes change and uncertainty. Mm-hmm. Um, but for and crisis me, the, really implies that it was bad before, which you're you're saying yeah. you know, it wasn't necessarily bad. No, it wasn't. It not at all. Um, and it's not like it was a moment in time where Mm -hmm. like there was a crisis one day and then there wasn't, it was over, over many years as, as these transformations often happen. And I would say for me, like the thing that, um, that I had to sit with was almost like grieving what, what, like the, what, like old, like dreams, like letting go of old dreams and visions of myself that I had for many years and being willing to like, let those go. And for that was a big one, right? Where it's like, I had a dream for many years that I was going to be, you know, one of the best investors in New York and that I was going to eventually build a firm and be a partner at, you know, at my own shop and so on and so forth. And I had to let that dream go. And so that, that was a big one. I would say another one is that, um, for a long time, I oscillated between, you know, first it was, I'm an investor, part-time coach. Then I was, I'm a coach, part-time investor. And that oscillated. And then finally I was like, I'm going to integrate these and they're going to be 50, 50. And, and what, what I noticed was that this investor identity that again, coming back to safety and security, power and status, like there was a part of me that wanted to hang on to that. And there was a there was a part of me that loved being in the information flow and kind of knowing what were the cool companies and also lots of people coming to me and sent, and at a certain point in time I just had to be like I had to look in the mirror and I was like okay you have a you have enough lived experience as a coach and you have enough lived experience as an investor like which one feels more resonant? And after doing that for a number of years, it was very clear, like, yeah, I want to coach. And for me, 
it was also not just about what was in alignment, but it was also about like, I want to be great at what I do and straddling two different worlds, I believe is, a, is not a recipe for becoming great at something, right? If, and for mm-hmm. me, like I eventually want to be a master at, at my craft and this is something I want to do for a long period of time. And if I am, if I'm trying to do too many things, I'm never going to be great at one of them. And so at a matter, at, at a certain point in time, I was just like, okay, I'm going to pick a lane. And, but letting go of that took a long time. Like there was mm-hmm. a lot of back and forth, I, despite loving coaching and feeling like instinctively, like it was my calling and like, you know, I, it, these patterns go, go very deep and they, they have a lot of power. I, I actually use this analogy. I don't know if it's a good analogy, but I'm going to run with it. But it's like, you know, these, these re, you know, Annie, well, first Annie Duke, the famous poker player, I heard her on a podcast say the hardest thing to quit is an identity. <laughs> and, and, and I agree with her. And, and to me, I use the analogy of, uh, like a horror movie where like the, the villain at the end of the movie somehow gets this like superhuman strength and you, you can't take them out until like it takes some act of God by the uh, protagonist to take, to, to finally like, you know, get them getting, get them to rest. And I think like our, our strongest identities, even when they're, we're starting to be able to see through them, um, they, they tend to take on a life of their own because, you know, going back to what I said earlier, you're grieving. It's like, you have to, you, you know, a part of you in some ways is dying. And even though it's, it's a, it's a mental formation, it's a narrative, um, and as, as a result, you have to grieve that death, especially in the face of not knowing what's going to come on the horizon and being able to step into what's next with, you know, an open heart, open mind and clear eyes. Mm-hmm. And how do you feel like your home and your loved ones and just sort of your personal life gave you the support and the space that you needed to navigate those transitions and those challenges during that time? Yeah. Uh, well, as you were asking the question, the immediate thing came to mind was Mm -hmm. upstate. So in, in January of 2020, I had just closed and, and I'm putting this in quotes, an angel fund. Mm -hmm. Um, I raised basically $6 million from friends and friends of friends to, to invest basically part time when I was coaching. Mm-hmm. And so I, I basically just closed the fund and I was running around New York doing the whole, you know, the, the 60 plus hour grind, you know, meeting to meeting back to back. And then all of a sudden COVID hit and mm-hmm. our family was like, we're going to head upstate. We had a place here and we're just, we're going to get out of the city. And the disengaging from that world and going upstate and being in nature and thinking like, I remember even saying to, to my wife, Oh, we're just going to go out for a few weeks and then, (laughs) you know, we'll go back to the city. And then sure enough, that led to, you know, almost 18 months we were up here. And I think going from the city in that environment to being upstate and being what really felt like home, not to say that our apartment didn't, but you know, the home that we created up here, that's, that's where the real shift, because I was like, Oh, wait a minute. Like I don't have to run around the city anymore. And then I started working from home and I was like, Oh wait, this is actually amazing. And that is that, that, that those 18 months of, being at home, seeing my daughter every single day, um, that was the thing that transformed me. I think more than anything wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't the, because like in some ways, I think that the disengaging out of New York and going upstate and, and working from home was the thing that shift. It was almost like the final straw that, that broke the camel's back. Mm-hmm. Um, but it very, very fortunate that things played out that way. If you look at uh, transitions, which is 
arguably one of the most famous books ever written on the subject by William Bridges, you know, what he would say, like in any ending, um, there are, there are five things that, that, that happen. And he call I, he doesn't call them this, but there are five words that begin with dis D I S Mm -hmm. there's disengage. So basically you have to disengage from the life, from the environment, right? There's dismantle. So you have to take away all the old routines and habits. Mm -hmm. There's disidentify, which is no longer identifying with that old identity and way of being. There's disenchant, which is now like no longer believing all the stories and the narratives around that particular uh, life. And then the last is disorient, which is being disoriented in this kind of in this ending space as kind of things are dissolving around you. And I, 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 I share that because the first stage is that that disengage and having a place to go home in that storm and feeling really comfortable because transition is very, very chaotic. But being able to go home and feeling like it's comfortable and safe and it, there's no feeling in the world. Um, so, so that's why for me being upstate and having an amazing home that, that, that I wanted to be at every day in nature. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was, that was, that was transformational for me. Amazing. And now you're helping so many other people through these moments of transition. I'm curious, just because this is a podcast about home, how often does home come up in your conversations when you're talking with people who are looking to make some kind of transition in their career or in their life? How often does it center around home? Well, here's what I would say is a few things. The work that I do, and it's partly, you know, I should back up for and say for, for almost five years, I coached exclusively CEOs and VCs um, that were we're all very much in in the heat of the business meeting you know they were all operating uh, mm-hmm. about 6 months ago i pivoted my practice to focus exclusively on leaders in transition um mm-hmm. to to almost help people go through the same process i went through on my own and um one of the things one of the reasons why i love this work more so than is that it it is so multidimensional right and um many of these people um don't just want to talk about what is it that i want to do it's more what's the life that i want to have and what are all the elements that are most important and yes work is I mean, these are all people that have had a lot of success and they also have tremendous optionality. So it's not like they're like, oh, I need to go find a job. It's I just took my company public and I, you know, like I've been out for two years and now I don't know what to do. And I've been floating around and everything I look at is confused. So here's where home comes in is just about everyone I work with are at home. Right. And so home is the place that they, they spend all their time when they're not running around the city that they live in. And so home is the anchoring point. And for many of these people in transition, you know, home is where they, they actually are able to disengage, you know, for those that, that I'm working with that are still in their day to day, um, that are, that, you know, that, that have, that have jobs or operating in some sort and whether it's their own firm or company is that home is actually where they're able to clear time so that they can focus on what's new. Recently, you wrote a story about navigating lostness and you asked, how do we feel at home in lostness? Which I think is such an interesting question. How have you managed to feel at home in these kind of difficult moments of transition? You mentioned, you know, all these people that you're coaching, they feel like they're kind of floating around. That That's such a hard feeling. And yet it can be such a gift because it helps you find the right path. 
but only if you can really kind of accept it and feel at home in that place, right? Yeah. Um, by no means am I like a survival expert, but mm-hmm. if you talk to if you talk to anybody that is 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 well versed in survival techniques, if you get lost, the first thing they recommend is stop moving and basically sit down and relax and breathe. Wow! Right, the idea is not not to panic. And what I've come to appreciate both through my own work and working with, with a lot of others is um, when we get lost, there's this tendency to move into fight and flight. And for very good reason, very, very good reason, right? Because we think that our survival is at threat. And w- when we get lost, it's how do we actually get really slow and begin to to relax. And what I've found through, again, through through um, being supported by some amazing practitioners is when I'm panicking, when I'm confused, that's a time to just slow down and breathe. You know, I love, I love yoga nidra uh, meditations, which Andrew Huberman, Dr. Andrew, Andrew Huberman, I think rebranded it to non-sleep deep rest. But if you go on YouTube, there's a, there's a bunch of incredible, like even 15 to 20 minute, they're like nervous system resets. And I think those are so excellent because they ground you and you emerge just feeling way lighter. And so doing these at home is, is a really great way to kind of eat, like just sort of downshift the nervous system and relax. You know, I'm thinking uh, one quick story. I'm thinking back to a time where I was conflicted about a big decision that I had to make when I was lost. And I like was playing it up in my head and, you know, like, I got to figure this out and this is a big problem. And I was making a really big fucking deal out of it. And I had this coaching session with this incredible coach who I still work with Steve March. He runs a coaching Academy called the Lethia. And I remember it was like almost like a meditation where he like brought me into my body and like was just following my sensations and, you know, how, like, how would you describe this? And I would describe it and he would like, is it there anymore? And I'd be like, no, but he's like, well, what do you sense now? And then I'd be like, oh, and now I have, you know, this sharp pain in my elbow. And anyhow, I would just over like 30 minutes, we were just tracking how I was like, things were moving in real time through my body. I'd be like, oh, now I'm having the thought that this is occur. Anyhow, at the end of doing this with him, he said, okay, well, what's the, how's the problem seem from net from here? And I was like, what problem? And so that's the power of slowing down when we're lost Mm -hmm. and noting that like, this is an unfoldment. It's like it, we're not going to ever have perfect information. Our <laughs> brains are too small. Our brains don't work that way. We're never going to get full information. And so can we just slow down and just ask ourselves like, okay, we're lost. Let's breathe. Can we accept ourselves for being lost? And what's the next bet? Like, what's the best guess? What's the next way forward? You mentioned it's an unfolding and, you know, I think a transformation is never point A to point B, but it can seem like that in our minds. Like, okay, I'm going to start here and I'm going to go here, but we're really always changing. It's not really something that you're done with, which I think is, you know, you're living this right now. Like you're still transitioning. Now you guys are moving full time upstate, you know, you're still on this path and it'll keep changing. But I think we can kind of fool ourselves into thinking like, Oh, I'm going to be done. I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to be done. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or like when, when I, when I finally, you know, have $10 million in the bank, then I can relax. (laughs) Right. Then, then, then finally I'll have made it. And and it's interesting this morning because I'm exploring this book concept uh, and I've been thinking a lot around identity and specifically mm-hmm. identity fluidity, but not in like the uh, sort of the current zeitgeist around, you know, what I would consider like the culture wars. Um, 
which are okay. Like if I, if I look at my life over a timeline, so like, let's say I was born in 1979. So on one end of the page, it's 1979. On the other end of the page is 2023. And I just started listing all the different chapters of my life, childhood, adolescence, college, early career, mid career, present time. And underneath all of those, I wrote down, okay, what are the roles that I've played? What roles were given to me or that I created? Um, what are the values? What are the stories? What are the different groups that I, that I belong to? And I just mapped this out. This is what I did this morning because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a little crazy. <laughs> and what's, what's incredible is actually seeing how our identities shift and evolve naturally as we move through the world. And, and so I bring this up because um, we all go through transitions. We all go through change. Even those that don't want to go through it, right, that, that are just stuck in their ways, inevitably, mm-hmm. you know, we, they go through change. And so I think this, this idea that identities are not as solid as we think, um, or let me say they're not as solid as, as they seem. And, you know, obviously it can be a disorienting idea to be like, well, what do you mean? Um, that can be very scary and understandably. So, um, what, what I, what I'm, the point that I'm bringing home is that, um, this is a natural process, right? This is, this is kind of embedded in the way that, um, yeah, the way that nature is right. Like I think I love the metaphor of like a, a snake skin, right? Like sk- mm-hmm. snakes shed their skin and they regrow. And I think humans are very, very much the same way if we allow ourselves to unfold. Absolutely. And I think you work with a very interesting population of people when you start thinking about those, you know, people who have just IPO'd or they've had success in a, in a certain identity. And then all of a sudden they sort of lose that sense of self because they're not running that company anymore. And they thought they would be where they wanted to be, but they're actually like, oh, who am I now without that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What have you learned working with that group of people? So... I work with people basically ages 35 to 55 in mm-hmm. that in that range and inevitably not all of them but a, a bunch of them have those big um questions of hmm you know not only like what do I want to do with the rest of my life but th- these realizations of hmm I don't I I, I I'm not as successful as I thought I was going to be, or I haven't made as much money, or I should have done this differently, and I'm not where I thought I was going to be. And that's very common, even for very, very, very highly um, successful people. And I think that's an opportunity to, in that case, what, what I will do is often have them feel into these parts that have deep regret, shame, guilt, because these are the kind of the underlying feelings of, yeah, you know, like my life hasn't in some ways amounted to what I thought it was going to be. And so between the, 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 the guilt, the shame, the sadness, the grief, whatever you want to call it, we'll do work around that and help them tap into those emotions and try to understand where that's coming from Mm -hmm. and find some acceptance, you know, and try to have them find some self compassion for, for not having the outcome or the success that they wanted. Um, and that can be in a variety of domains in life and, to me, I think that that work is really critical, especially in transition, because, you know, and sometimes that work takes a long, long time, you know, years. Um, 
but it's important because it helps turn the page. You know, I'm thinking of a client that I worked with not too long ago that, um, you know, was working with a unicorn. He was a senior, you know, C-level executive and uh, had an opportunity to take money off the table when the market was, was, was booming and didn't, held on, and the market has tanked. And a bunch of his coworkers got, got rich and he didn't. And he now is living with that regret and he's angry at himself and, you know, comparing himself to all of his peers, both, you know, former peers at work. And so I just use that as an example of like a lot of the work that I'll do with this executive is helping him process a lot of these feelings of guilt, shame, resentment, regret, Um, so that he can move on and create that space for what's next. Mm -hmm. Big part of that is like like self-compassion and acceptance. Like, can you accept yourself for making that decision? Absolutely. I think even for people who achieve a level of success even beyond what they thought they would achieve, there's probably still that moment of what now? You know, I think that you probably see a lot of those types too Uh. who are... Oh yeah, I mean, I mean, I, my my practice at, at any given time, I work with twelve to fourteen clients, and I would say at least sixty five percent, call two thirds, are people that have had insane success, and they're thinking about what's next. Like they're you know, an IPO of their first company isn't enough. Mm-hmm. They you know they want to keep on going or. You know, three New York Times bestseller books aren't enough. And when you are working with either one of those groups, what's the first thing you ask them to help them get to the place where they want to be, where they're in a place of acceptance and happiness? You know, what do you lay out first of, you know, asking them what's important to you and where do you want to be? For me, I'm I'm a student of a lot of different models of change and transition, and so as a practitioner, my, my first task is to really understand where they are in, in the journey and, and, and not just like where they are in their process, but what's their emotional context and state. Mm-hmm. And so from there, I'm able to, to in some ways, um, begin to understand what are the, the questions, because if you're a year out, you know, if you, if you've been a successful operator and you've been on sabbatical for a year and now you're ready to start to explore possibilities, that's very different than someone who is, um, you know, hasn't left their company yet. That's a founder of a company that is like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I want to leave the company I founded. How Mm -hmm. the hell am I going to do that? So, before we can even look forward, we have to understand where they are and then we can start to, to look forward. But I think like my philosophy is kind of grounded in three different, um, realms of, of experience. Um, there is what I call reflection, which is looking back and kind of understanding where we've come from, just the way we're wired there is the, um, I'll skip ahead. There's the future, like the visioning, you know, if we're mm-hmm. going to stick with verbs. So there's reflection, then there's visioning, which is more, Hey, who do I ultimately want to become? And not just who do I want to become, but what are possible versions of myself? There was a researcher out of Stanford. Hazel Marcus was, is her name. And she came up with this idea of possible selves. And so always it's, okay, what are, what are the possible selves? What are the versions of ourselves that we might want to express in this next chapter? So it's not like there is one perfect expression. And then once we square that, then it's, um, then it's awareness. And the, the third realm is awareness, which is we're going to go out and we're going to, we're going to test these possible selves. And through our awareness, we're going to, 
we're going to tune into what resonates, like what vibrates, where does our curiosity go? Where does our energy go? And then that helps the unfolding that should just naturally show the path forward. Like I think about today, there's a, you know, I'm working with a super talented president COO of a unicorn and, and they, um, and, and she, she has been, uh, on a, like a break for about a year, I would say. And today we explored like a number of these, these potential selves and a new one emerged where she's like, Oh, I think I want to be a teacher. And then it's like, Oh, well, what are some experiments you can run to go and explore that? And like, if she goes and runs experiments and it doesn't feel resonant and creative and flow and then just put it down Mm -hmm. and there's five other possible selves that she's looking into right now and has been for a while and so anyhow to step back there's you know this sort of reflection um envisioning and then awareness and these three taken together are really powerful but first you have to understand exactly where the person is in their journey Mm -hmm. and when you think back to the beginning of your journey And at the very beginning of this conversation, you talked about sort of all of the different possible selves that you really have become. Do you think that that person at the very beginning would be surprised at where you are now and all of the possible selves who you are now? Floored, floored. I mean, today I was, so, so if you look at it, I'm, I'm referring to my notes from this morning, Mm -hmm. you know, it's like, it's, it's crazy, right? Like there's so much dimensionality to my life now, uh, it is, it's amazing, right? Like I went from, for a long time, just identifying as a VC and a husband Mm -hmm. and like maybe a meditate, but like, let's say like if we're, if it was like pre learning how to meditate, like even pre marriage. So let's say 10 years ago, I, I mean, before I got married, I was a worker. I was an investor. My entire identity was invested in it. And now I'm a meditator, coach, facilitator, girl, dad, writer, sobriety advocate, right? Cook. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Like all these different things. And like, there's no way I would have been able to even predict that this would be who I am and what my life would look like. And I'm just embracing the natural process. And who knows, like maybe in five years, I just decide that I want to write full time or maybe in, you know, a decade, I say, you know what, I, I'm, I'm ready for my, my next chapter. And that's the thing is like, it's part of the reason why when I, people ask me what I do is I was like, well, I help, you know, high performers in midlife discover their next calling. And I use the word next very deliberately because I don't believe that we have one vocation. I don't believe that we have one calling. Like, I think that especially as we live, we live longer, like hopefully we have many. And so, um, I think we need to celebrate that. And something that I even say is like, I was working with a senior product leader who was at a point in his life, you know, serial entrepreneur who decided to take a job with a, with a big company. Um, and it was very deliberate because he said that he wanted to provide a comfortable life for his family. And this job allowed him to have the balance and the calling in his life right now is to provide a comfortable life for his family. And honestly, like, I think I can't think of a, of a better calling than that. And, you know, my guess is it will change over time for him. But right now, that's what he feels called to express. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. This has been an incredible conversation. I want to get to our lightning round of fun questions. Bring so it on. To start out, what's a space in your home that you love? Ooh, I think the barn here. The barn mm-hmm. is my is my favorite. It's it's just such a, a very high ceilings, lots of light, um, very comfortable. Uh, thankfully, my wife is a quasi designer, so she made it look really awesome. And it's just I love spending time here. What's one thing you're trying to stop doing, and one thing you're trying to spend more time on? 
Yeah, one thing I'm I'm trying to stop doing, believe it or not, is um is taking on new clients uh, because I I want a lot of space for uh, exploring a book project in mm-hmm. this course. That um, so I think that's it's what I'm working on with my coach at the moment is setting boundaries, and then what was that? What was the, the what do I want to start? Mm-hmm. Yeah, what are you? What do you want to spend more time on? Um. You know, honestly, I know this is going to sound lame. I feel like I'm like I'm doing it all right now. Like I I I there's nothing I want to start. Like I feel like I'm now at a point where um um it, it's all it's all flowing. I'm doing exactly what I want to do. I just want to make a little bit more time to do what I'm currently focused on. But mm-hmm. you know, I have my meditation practice dialed in. I'm um, working out five to six days a week, I'm spending lots of time with my kids. My coaching practice is thriving. I'm writing every day. It's like, uh, this feels, this feels like, uh, yeah, I feel very, very lucky. Very, very fortunate. Mm-hmm. With your little girls, what's one, uh, children's toy that you love and one that you hate? Huh? That's a really good one. I mean, we, we do a lot of books, a lot of painting, um, I would say the one that I love actually, now that I'm sort of letting is Legos. We do it. We, we, I, 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 I haven't mentioned that in my multidimensionality. I, I'm a sucker for Legos. I have a huge mm-hmm. collection. I'm, I'm kind of a geek in that regard. And my, my daughter and I do Legos together Aww, and it's, awesome. it's amazing. And the one okay. that I hate, um, I don't know if I ha- maybe like she loves tea sets with and you know basically fills water up like cups it and so like the floor gets wet and I end up like <laughs> with like a dry sock step in it and then oh. so I think it's the, the tea sets kind of irk me at times. I get that more than Speaking irk. Of I which, get tri- I yeah I get triggered. Yeah, I get that. What's your household pet peeve? Ooh, um, household pet peeve. Oh, I know for sure. Uh, I don't, I, for, for the men listening, I don't know about you, but I, I tend to have to clean up after my wife. Um, she just leaves her dishes everywhere. And so my household pet peeve is that somehow I've become the de facto, uh, cleaner upper of specifically of like dishes and cups and things of that nature. So that's my household pet peeve is I like to run a tight ship. I like having clean (laughs) countertops. And so um, I would say that's my pet peeve. Who is somebody you admire who you think really lives well? Who comes to mind for me is Jim Detmer. He's the founder of the Conscious Leadership Group. I just, I, I really admire Jim and the way that he lives and the way that he, his, um, yeah, that he's, he's chosen to live his life. He's a man of integrity and um, he spends a lot of time in nature and um, I'm just, I just love what he's put out into the world. And Amazing. he's someone I, I really respect and admire. That's a great one. And what inspires you to live better? My girls. Yeah, I think yeah, that definitely makes definitely my girls. Awesome. Well, Steve, thank you so much. This has been such a nice conversation. I really appreciate you having us into your home. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you to Steve Schlafman for welcoming us today. Follow along with Steve at schlaff.co and at schlaff on Twitter. I'm Kristen Twyford, and if you enjoyed our conversation, I hope you'll subscribe to Make Yourself at Home and leave us a review. Make Yourself at Home is presented by Nines, household management software that helps you manage your properties and everything that comes with them so you can make the most of your time at home. Learn more at ninesliving.com.